Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be continuing our discussion of dynamics. Specifically, we're going to start talking about friction. Friction, of course, being that wonderful thing that causes stuff to stop. Without it, as we've discussed using Newton's laws, things would keep moving forever. And that's what happens in space. But we're not in space, probably. Maybe you're watching this from the International Space Station. Seems unlikely, but maybe. Now, what we're going to see with friction is that it's... It's not actually going to add that much to things, right? Because we already know that friction opposes motion. But what we probably don't know is that there's actually two forms of friction. The first version of friction is called static friction. And the other form of friction is called kinetic friction. Now, both of them are friction, obviously. It's got friction in the name. But they do slightly different things. Specifically, Static friction is the friction of something before it starts moving, and kinetic friction is the friction of something after it starts moving. What do I mean by that? Well, have you ever noticed the fact that trying to get something going is very hard, but once it starts moving, it's actually pretty easy to keep it moving? Right? You ever tried to push anything really heavy? Uh, maybe, you know, you've helped your friend move a grand piano recently, or perhaps you've had to push a car that got stuck in the ditch or something little pothole well, around here, a big pothole. Either way, have you ever noticed that? Well, that's because these two types of friction are a little bit different. Of the two, static friction is perhaps the simplest. It will immediately rise to match whatever opposes it. If you had done the uh, dynamics, Newton's dynamics activity, you will have noticed this happen, right? So if I push on something with a force of 50 Newtons, then friction will oppose that with 50 newtons. If I push with 100 newtons, it will oppose with 100 newtons. It'll keep going up, but there's a limit to this. It's not infinite, because if it was, nothing would ever move, right? Because every time I try to apply a force, more force would come back at me. Now, this limit is when static friction disappears. And when static friction disappears like that, we call it sort of the situation where something begins to move. Begins to move. That's an important one. Now, when that happens, we go from static to kinetic. Now, I guess I should also mention here, of course, the units and the various ways that we're going to write this. So friction can be written in a couple different ways, as we've already discussed. And what we're going to see here is that static friction, we're going to say, look, something like this. S, and kinetic friction is going to have a K. Now, that said, very often it's context dependent. We're going to know what's going to happen here, and we're going to be able to like drop off the Ks or the Ss that we're attaching there. Remember, that uh, little symbol there, which we use for friction, it's called mu. It's a Greek letter, and we'll talk about what that comes from in literally a second. Because, you see, this whole thing about begins to move, we can show it with a graph. I know, graphing. So here we go. We're going to have our graph, and what we're going to see is that the force of friction versus the force applied will rise to match until it hits an upper limit. And at that limit there, this is the whole begins to move. Right. So at each point, it matches until I hit that limit, and then I switch to kinetic friction. So this whole section here is static, and this whole section here is kinetic, and this part here is where I move from one to the other. Now, where that limit is, is from an equation. And that equation looks something like this. The first term is static friction, and it's going to be the limit for static friction. So, heck, we could put a little bit more here. We could say, like, max or something. This limit on static friction is found by taking the coefficient of static friction and the force normal. Now, the coefficient of static friction is represented by this mu, which is why we have a mu here. And the reason for this thing is that it's sort of, um, you can think of it as like a percent contact between the two surfaces, right? Like right now, this eraser here is touching the ground pretty well, but like what happens if it was only barely touching the ground or it was sort of like got a lot of space underneath? So 
what it kind of represents is just how well the two surfaces are rubbing together, right? Like if I do this with my hands and I rub, my hands get warm. If I do this with my hands and rub, not a lot happens, right? Because there's no contact. So usually the coefficient of static friction, or really any coefficient of friction, is written in the form of a decimal. And another little thing to see, right, is we're talking about Fn. Now, the reason we're talking about Fn is because, remember, we need contact between the two surfaces. Well, what's causing this thing to have contact with this surface? Well, gravity. Gravity pulls down on this, and that causes the table to push up, which, of course, causes contact. So the more gravity, or the more force there is going down, right, I can increase the force by pushing. Arr. The more gravity there is, the more contact there is, the more force of friction we get. Now, obviously, this doesn't necessarily work in space because space is weird, but again, you're probably not watching this from the International Space Station. So that's the basic idea of static friction. Once we switch from static, which remember, rises to match the force applied until I hit that limit, you'll notice that the kinetic friction is a flat number. It's a single number. This is why, for example, once you start setting something to move, it just sort of slides along. And you'll notice that that number is lower than the limit that we had before. There's a, unfortunately, it's difficult to explain exactly how friction works because it's kind of an empirical number, meaning it's a number that we get by measurements, right? We, we take objects, we put them on other objects, and we see how much force we need to pull them. And then we say, well, that must be what the friction is. We don't exactly have a concrete or at least an easily explainable uh, definition for how friction really works. I say percent contact, but that's not entirely right. And the chemists in the audience you may remember things like intermolecular forces, and they might think about different intermolecular forces, such as hydrogen bonds and, and van der Waal forces and these things, which might lead in the direction of explaining friction, but even that isn't completely right either. There are a lot of possibilities, but none of them are perfect. But we're not done yet. We've also got to deal with kinetic friction. And it turns out that when you get from the static limit and you switch, switch into kinetic friction, this formula, we basically get to use it again. The formula for kinetic friction is exactly the same as the static limit. The difference is now, of course, we have a different coefficient of friction. This number here is going to be different than this number here. It's also going to be smaller because at all points, kinetic friction is smaller than static friction. In part, again, with the chemistry thing, you can think of it as if I'm sitting there, not moving, I have lots of time for those intermolecular forces to hook into each other. But if I'm moving, well, it's much harder. So that's sort of the fundamental basics. Now we just need to maybe take a look at how to use all of this. So, you know, put an example together and see how that makes sense. So let's get going on that. Okay, so let's work through an example. Now, we're going to do with something fairly simple to begin with, of course. We're going to have ourselves a block, and we're going to make it 10 kilograms, and it's going to be sitting on a surface. And we're going to say that this surface has a coefficient of static friction of about 0 0.5. And we're going to say that the coefficient of kinetic friction is about 0 0.4. Now we're going to work through a series of different calculations. So the first one we're going to say very simply here, what is the static limit? What's the static limit going to be? I'm putting the max up top. Technically, I could put it down below. It doesn't really matter. The static limit. What's the static limit? Now, in order to find this, of course, we have our equation. So the static limit is going to equal to the coefficient of static friction times the force normal. Well, this is a one-dimensional problem. And in a one-dimensional problem, the forces of gravity and the force normal have to be equal to each other. So that force of gravity and this force normal have to be the same. Well, let's make this arrow look a little more convincingly the same, shall we? There we go. So over here, when we're doing our equation, we can go, OK, so what I'm looking for is going to be equal to 0 0.5, and it's going to be equal to Fn. Hmm. Well, Fn is going to be the same as Fg. Uh, let's put that in black. 
So we just need to be able to find what fg is, and then we'll know what fn is, which means we can solve the rest of our question. So fg, we hopefully remember, is going to be equal to mass times gravitational acceleration. We know the mass is going to be 10 kilograms. We know that gravity is going to be 9.8. So we're going to get a nice 98 newtons, which is the same as our force normal. So I get to take that 98. It's equal to this. I plug it in right here, 98. So all we have to do to find the static limit is take our 98, and we have to half it. Once we do that, we're going to get that the static limit is going to be 49 newtons. All right, that's our first question. Simple so far. B, if I apply a force of 4 newtons, what is the force of friction? So what we have to do is analyze that and go, OK, first things first, are we at the static limit? And the answer is clearly not, because the static limit is 49, and we're at 4. So it means if you remember the way that graph looked, that we drew quickly earlier on, shouldn't have erased it, just like so. It's not erasing at all the way I want it to. So if you remember at that graph that we showed earlier, we are in this static part of the friction graph. So if my force applied is only 4, my force of friction is also going to be 4 because I'm not at the static limit. So the force of friction equals 4 newtons. That's it. We're done. To be honest, that's so simple, you're not really going to see a lot of questions about that. We're mostly going to be talking about things about, like, say, the static limit, or we're going to be talking about the limit between the um, force of static and the force kinetic, aka that whole part right here where we just begin to move. But uh, let's take a look at an example of that. Question C, what is the kinetic force of friction? Question C, what is force of friction kinetic? Well, there's a reason I didn't erase too much here. This is very easy to adjust because the two equations have the same basic structure. The difference is only in the details. You'll notice You'll notice the 98 here, right? The force normal, well, that's going to be the same, right? Just because I'm moving doesn't mean gravity suddenly changes. So this is still 98. This is no longer 0.5, though. Now it is 0.4. So that is really the only change here. So if we do that times 0.4, we're going to get Three point nine two. Oops, I moved the decimal in the wrong spot. Thirty nine point two. So that's what we're looking at. Okay, we've got ourselves thirty nine point two because that's going to be about forty percent of ninety eight. Doing these calculations, one of the things about dynamics calculations is that they're generally quite simple because you get to reuse a lot of the same numbers. The mass doesn't change. It doesn't suddenly get heavier or lighter just because I'm moving or not moving. So once I calculate a certain value, I just get to kind of keep using it over and over again. I just have to make sure that I apply the right variables to each question. In this particular case, we're looking at 0.4 instead of the 0.5 that we had before. Because of course, as we've discussed, the kinetic friction is always lower than the static friction. So. The next question here, this one's going to get a little more tricky. Uh, let's erase all of this. This is going to be D. What is the total force in the horizontal if the force applied is equal to, what did I come up with? I said 100. So the total force in the horizontal is going to be what? Well, we've got our force applied going this way, and we're going to say that it's 100 newtons.
And we have our force of friction going back the other way. And we're going to say that it is 39.2 newtons. And we know it's that because we just calculated it. And it doesn't change. So this is going to be Fa minus F mu, specifically mu k. Oh, we forgot to put that down here. This is going to be F mu k. We then fit in our numbers. We already calculated that it's 39.2. And we already know that the force applied is going to be 100. So we subtract them. We take 100 and we subtract 39, and we're going to get about 60.8. And there you go. That's our answer for that. That's how much force is in total acting on this thing, right? There's the force that I'm applying, and there's the friction taking that force away, removing it from the whole system. OK, we're almost done. We've only got one more example we're going to do. Heck, I'm going to throw it over here. E, what is the acceleration of this particular object? Hmm. Well, forces create accelerations. And we know what the force is. We just calculated it. The force is 60.8. So if the total force is 60.8, and we know the mass, any force can be listed as ma. So f, in any force includes the sum of forces. So this sum of forces, as we just discovered, is 60.8 is equal to 10 times acceleration. So we're going to take our 60.8, we're going to divide it by 10, and we're going to get an acceleration of 6 meters per second squared. And that's it. Whenever you guys are working through these problems, the general thing you're going to do is that you're going to be doing it step by step. And so many of these values are going to be repeated you get to use the force of gravity calculation, huh, the force of gravity calculation, multiple times. You used it to calculate the static limit. You didn't need to use it to calculate the force of friction in a particular situation, but you can use it to calculate the kinetic friction, and then that kinetic friction is constant, right? If we look over here at our graph, the kinetic friction part is a flat line. It stays the same no matter how much force I apply. So the more for force I apply, the more acceleration I'm going to get. Because if I apply 1,000 units of force here, well, this still stays as 39, which means now I'm going to have even more left over. When that happens, you get to then work it out. You get to see, oh, OK, so like this is 100, because it tells me. This is 39, because I calculated already. That means in total, I have 60. And then what's my acceleration? People are always like, can I just find the acceleration for the force applied? Well, you can, but the problem is, is that the force of friction is also going to experience an acceleration, right? Because I'm pushing the thing forward, it's speeding up. But friction's pushing it back, it's going to slow it down a bit. So this, what we see here, where I use the 60, this is the total, this is the net, this is when I add everything up. This is when I take the vectors, one going one way, one going the other, I put them all together, and then I solve rather than trying to solve each vector individually. So take a look at some of these practice problems. See what you can do. You're going to find that for the most part, a lot of these things are really, really straightforward. The tricky part only comes in understanding what numbers to use at a particular situation. Obviously, for kinetic friction, we had to use the kinetic numbers. For static friction, we had to use the static numbers. It's a one-dimensional problem, so we get to reuse Fn equals Fg. But that's not always going to be true, as we'll see when we get to two-dimensional dynamics. But that'll be for another time, and I will see you guys then.